Hello everyone and welcome to Code Deconstructed. This is the first in a series of videos where we take a look at popular open source projects, take apart their source code, see how they work, and learn something from them. In this video, we'll be taking a look at Pandoc, the universal markup converter. Now, I chose Pandoc because it's a Haskell project and I think Haskell needs more exposure than it's gotten so far. Also, it's the most popular Haskell project on GitHub. And finally, I use Pandoc myself in a few projects, including my website, vocabulink.com, and my personal website. So I'm a little bit familiar with it, and I think it makes a great candidate. So what is Pandoc, and why is it worth taking a look at and taking apart? Pandoc is a universal markup converter, but it's most well known for its ability to parse markdown and convert it to a number of different output formats. Uh, the most used probably is HTML, but it also supports outputting to PDF and a number of others. Now, I'll show you a little bit about how Pandoc works, but first let's go ahead and check out the source code. We'll use git clone to clone it from GitHub. And then, so that you can follow along with me if you want, I will check out a tag for the release that I'm using. So I'm using Pandoc version 1.9.4.5, and John, the author of Pandoc, has nicely tagged the releases. So if you use git check out 1.9.4.5. We will be working with the same repository. So I mentioned that Pandoc can do these things. Let's actually see it in action. And uh, first, uh, let's just pass Pandoc some markup. So we'll give it a header and code deconstructed. Panoc by default assumes its input is markdown and assumes that its output is HTML. So this gives us an HTML fragment. We can get more complicated with it. Uh, and I think a good place to start is looking at the readme for Pandoc itself. Because if you take a look on GitHub, the readme is text, but it looks like it's actually Markdown. Uh, GitHub just doesn't parse it as such because it doesn't have a .md on the end of its name. So let's take care of that ourselves. So pandoc from the readme, output to readme.html. Looks like it was successful. So we should be able to open that. And there we go, there's the HTML from that file. So if that doesn't give you a good enough idea of what it does, let's also try converting it to a PDF. Now the syntax for this is a little bit strange because the PDF output option requires you to specify an output file. There's no actual type option for it. But this will now read the readme markdown file and output a PDF. And we can view that. And there you go. Great, so we know what uh, Pandoc can be used for. Let's actually take a look at the source code. Now I use Emacs, and I like to be able to jump between the definitions of functions. So I want a tags file. And for that, I can use task tags with the E option for Emacs or E tags files on the current directory, which is the source directory, and we'll output it to the file named tags. Now in Emacs, you can enter the source directory and let's go ahead and visit tags table on tags. 
I went through the Pandoc source a little bit before recording this video just to get an idea of where things are and what, what might be interesting to take a look at. And I think the most interesting part of Pandoc, at least in the beginning, is the markdown parser. Now, there are a number of other parsers as well that aren't specific to Markdown that we can start with because they'll give us a more concrete idea of how the parsing in Pandoc actually works. Let's start with parsing.hs. I took a look at this file ahead of time and found what I think is a nice concrete example of a parser that we can all get our heads around to start with. And that is the email address parser. Now, each of these parsers are what are called parser combinators, and if you're not familiar with that, I'll try to explain now how they work. So, what exactly is a parser combinator? Without getting into too much of the theory behind it, a combinator combines simple parsers into more complex parsers, and for our purposes, as they're implemented by Parsec, the main advantage for parser combinators is that they are easy to read and work with. As opposed to something like handwritten parsers in C or a recursive descent parser that you may have come across in the past, you can look at just the part of the parser that you're focusing on without worrying about uh, the state that the rest of the parser is in at the time. They read a lot like BNF notation, which you may have seen if you've read through any of the RFCs published by the Internet Engineering Tax Task Force. Here's an example of a BNF grammar from Wikipedia for U.S. postal addresses. Now, to me, this looks like it's using the Parsec library. And if you're familiar with Parsec, a lot of this will be familiar. If not, you're just going to have to take my word for it. Let's take a look at the first, or rather the second line of the email address parser function. And what that does is it starts by saying, let's look for an alphanumeric character. We'll name that first letter. And then look for zero or more email characters. Email character is not a primitive parser that's defined by the Parsec library. It's defined in this file itself. In fact, you can see it above. Email character is either an alphanumeric character or any character that satisfies the following. Basically, a character that's a dash plus, underscore, or dot. And returning to the email address parser, we now have the name part of the email address, or the box. The parser moves on to look for an at sign, and then a domain. Again, domain is defined just above this function as First, one or more domain characters, which are either an alphanumeric character or a dash. And then, one or more uh, uh, dots and one or more domain characters. Essentially, uh, a domain is alphanumeric characters and dashes separated by dots. And that's it. That's all there is, according to Pandoc, for parsing email addresses. So this is a rather restrictive parser. It doesn't support every possible email address out there. But it seems to be good enough, and that's the nice thing about looking at production code, is that this has been tested. Now, we can only get so far by reading the source code to the Pandoc program. We really need to play with it ourselves to understand how it works at a deeper level. We could try loading this file into GHCI, but when we do, 
we come across an error about a missing module. And it turns out that Pandoc is complex enough and has enough dependencies that it would be pretty difficult to load the whole project in ourselves. What we could do instead is take just the parts of Pandoc that we're interested in playing with and place them into a separate file. Let's do that now. So I'll make a file called parse.hs and into it I'll place the email address parser. And the email address parser depends on these parsers above it, which we looked at briefly. And those are just the parts we're interested in there. Um, if we try and load this into GHCI, there's going to be a number of undefined functions. So I happen to know that gen parser is a part of the parsec library. And if we look at the imports, you can see that it's imported there. So let's do the same for our program. And that's gotten us quite a bit further. You can see that there are just two undefined functions left. Now, intercal, I happen to know, is part of data.list. And escape URI, I haven't seen. So we can take a look on Google and see which package that belongs to. Escape URI. There's no exact match, so that leads me to believe that escape URI is actually defined in Parsec itself. So using the tag file, escape you, let's look for escape URI. And there it is. We'll add that into the parse.hs. And now we still have a couple undefined symbols. One is escape URI string, which actually came up in this Google search, which is part of network.uri. And also is space, which I'll look for in the Pandoc source. There we go. Everything was loaded successfully. Now we have something we can actually play with, the email address parser on its own. Let's take a look at it. So it's defined, but how do we use it? Well, there's actually a function in the parsec library called parse that takes the parser to use, another argument which we're going to ignore for now, and then the string to parse. We'll use my email address and see what comes up. After loading some packages, we have the result here which is the pair of strings that we expected based on the documentation here. So it looks like it worked. Let's try an invalid email address. Sure enough, we got a parse error. So it says at column eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, it was expecting a letter, a digit, or an at symbol, which is if you look in the code, the parser probably got to this point where it had read some alphanumeric characters as well as some, uh, I'm sorry, one alphanumeric character as well as some email address characters. And then it was looking for either more email address characters or an at symbol and got to the end of the string. Let's try one more address. We'll try something that looks like a UUCP address. And we got a parse error. Now this is what we'd expect because email character here is defined as any alphanumeric character plus hyphen plus underscore or dot. It does not allow exclamation marks. But if you look up the email address format specification online you'll find out that the exclamation mark as well as a few other 
characters are allowed. So let's try extending this parser to allow exclamation marks as a valid email address character. We'll reload the source file and give it another try. And it worked. So you can see that we can make some changes to the parser and customize it. So how is this useful to us other than forming a basis for understanding the rest of Pandoc? I think we actually have enough here to create a useful application out of the parts. We could build a command line email address verifier. It wouldn't actually ver verify if the email address was valid, but it would at least verify that it was in a valid format. Why don't we try building that now? I'll write the parse.hs file into valid email.hs. Next, we'll need a main function so that it can run as a standalone program. And I'd like it to accept as an argument to the program the email address to, to verify. So if we received a single argument, we'll do something. And if we received nothing, we'll write out a usage line to the user. Get the program name, and we'll write out to standard error usage prog name email address. Then we'll exit with uh, an exit code indicating failure. And if we do receive an email address, then we can parse just like we did earlier, parse email address on the actual email. And if we received a left value, that's a failure. We can exit to indicate failure. If we receive a right value, we don't really care about what the value actually is. We just need to know that it's valid. We can exit with success. Let's see how that goes. All right, missing some imports here. We'll need system.io, system.environment for get args and get prog name. And are we missing anything else? That looks like system.exit. Okay, that's good. So to test it, I'm gonna switch back to the shell and compile valid email from valid email.hs and let's give it a try. So with no arguments, it should tell us how to use it and it exited with an error code. With an invalid address, it should exit with an error code of one. And with a valid email address, it should exit with the indication of success, which it does. So we've taken a look at what Pandoc is, what it can do, and we've taken our first steps into the source code, examining it in closer detail. We took a look at the email address parser and took it apart a bit and played with it so that we can understand how it's working at a deeper level. Next, we'll go to a higher level in the code and look at the markdown parsing itself. I hope you enjoyed the episode and I'll see you soon. <laughs>